Well, thank you very much uh, to everyone for coming this afternoon and thank you to Alex and Veronica for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Uh, so it's a bit tangential to the other topics of the conference, uh, but fortunately I will be able to make sense of doing some uh, quantum geometry during the second part of the talk because I will explain how all the results that I will be deriving can be understood in terms of some uh, kind of non-commutative Poisson structure. So, well, I would say that at that moment, but it's kind of the opposite of what you would think about being quantum, because usually quantum you would think that you are deforming a phase space. Here in some way my phase space will be a representation of some non-commutative algebra. So I'm kind of going in the backward direction. So let me start from something uh, that most of you, I'm pretty sure, are not really knowledgeable about, about because I will be starting with some uh, integrable systems. I'm, I'm trying to give you some motivation about what I will be speaking about. And so uh, in the integrable system community, it was realized that a uh, phase space for some nice integrable system called the Cardio Mosel system that I will introduce is constructed as follows. So we have a very nice phase space. So this is the M, which is made of two n times n matrices x and y, then a covector and a vector. Okay. And this space, well, you can realize it as just being some cotangent space, maybe. And so it has a Poisson structure, which is naturally defined. And what's also quite nice is that you have a, an action here of GLNC by sort of conjugation, at least conjugation on the two uh, square matrices, and then a kind of conjugation on the covector and the vector. Okay. And this action is by automorphism. So it's preserving the Poisson structure also that you have on that space. And so an observation by uh, Wilson, so at the end of the 90, uh, was the following. So if, in fact, uh, on that space you realize that for the Poisson structure and that action there is a moment map, which is given here by this commutator of the square matrices, plus some rank one uh, matrix given by the covector and the vector. And if you fix this moment map to just a multiple of the identity, it's just taken to be the identity for, uh, for ease, well, you can perform reduction, okay, so you can just look here at the GIT quotient, which for the rest of the talk, in fact, all my parameters will be such that I have a smooth space, so it's just an orbit space, okay, that I will consider as a complex manifold, okay. And this space, you realize that it's uh, the phase space of the Cardio system. So what does it mean? Well, there is some open dense subset in that space with extremely nice coordinates. Okay, so how do you get it? Well, if you assume that you can diagonalize your matrix X and just call these diagonal entries some Q1 up to Qn. Okay, so the interpretation as an integrable system for later will be that this Q should be seen as just some uh, a position of some particles. Okay, so if you think that these positions are just eigenvalues of one of your square matrices and then the V, the uh, covector here, is just made of ones. Okay, then by just looking at your moment map equation, you can really determine the rest. So your W will be made of minus one. And then your Y matrix is such that the diagonal entries are free. You can call them just PIs. And it so happens that by your reduction procedure, your uh, this Kalajam of the space or this reduced space as a Poisson structure. And in terms of these coordinates, Q and P, these are just double coordinates. Okay. And the diagonal entries are, are quite nice. They are in one over the difference of these uh, eigenvalues of the X matrix. Okay, so why is that nice? Well, because you can, well, when you write on the Poisson structure, you can easily see that the symmetric function of, for example, the Y matrix are Poisson commuting. Okay, so it means that any trace of Y to any power K is Poisson commuting with any such function. And in particular, if you look, for example, at the second of these functions, it is, in fact, the Hamiltonian of this Cardio model system, which is very interesting. Okay, and it has some uh, in some way physical forms or with a kinetic term, term and then a potential terms in one over the square of the distance of these particles. Okay, so this is nice because this, well, it, it was known how to construct uh, functions which were Poisson commuting with that one, but it was not realized how to get a completed phase space or really having the phase space where all the dynamics is taking place. And really when you know the story, you can just get the dynamics quite easily. So what I want to advertise is that uh, maybe some of you who are used to quiver variety will directly see the quiver, but really th this phase space is just a quiver variety. So for generalization later, the point will just be to say, well, what kind of quivers can we say? Oh, sorry, can we take? 
Okay, so a very short crash course on this case if you don't know about these quiver varieties. The idea is that we start uh, with such a quiver, so made of two arrows, and really we should think of that as just being a one loop quiver made by this loop X, which we extend by a new vertex and your new arrow coming from this new vertex. Okay, and then, well, because we need some uh, thing which will be even dimensional in the end, we will <laughs> double this quiver. So we will put arrows going backward for each arrow that we had in the original quiver. Okay, so far it's very standard if you know that. And then what we will do is just say that a representation space of this second quiver, this double, where we put a n-dimensional vector space at zero and a one-dimensional space as this infinity vertex, is just made of matrices as follow. Okay, so how do you get the matrices? Really, you just take a matrix which has the dimension at the tail of the uh, arrow times the dimension at the edge. So for example, your V is going from a one-dimensional to an n-dimensional vector space. Okay, and it's maybe the opposite convention for what you are used to. But so I will see V as being represented by a one times n matrix. And this is really what I have in that representation space. Which, in fact, for what I need is a representation space, not just of the quiver, but of the pass algebra of the quiver, because I will want to play on that uh, non-commutative algebra later on. Okay. And then once you realize that, well, that's it, because really the, the process of Hamiltonian reduction that I did before is the usual one that you do to get a quiver variety starting from the representation space of a quiver. So it was, in fact, uh, not really uh, the, the main point of that article of Wilson, really, that you can realize this phase space as a quiver variety as well. And so my upshot for today would be to say that almost all the structure can be understood directly at the level of the quiver. So in some way, you will get most of the, let's say, Poisson geometry as a corollary of whatever you can do at the level of the quiver. So that will be my main message for today. Uh, and so now for the plan of the talk, what I will do is just explain to you how to uh, construct integrable system on more general quiver varieties. And then, because I will really hide the Poisson structure in all these cases at the beginning, I will then just give you an idea of how I get it really just at the level of the quivers. So you could choose any, uh, instead of the identity matrix, you can choose any among zero? Uh, any multiple of the identity. Yes, that's what you could take, yes, yes. Okay. And, and this will be almost the same for all the other quivers that I will take. Yes. Um, and so in the last part of the talk, I will just uh, look at the multiplicative version of that using multiplicative quiver variety. So the story is sort of the same, but it, these are just different varieties. So before I start with the main point, is there any question? Yes. If you can go back for a second, so is, is there a good way to look at the quiver and, oh, maybe you're going to say this later. There's a good way to look at the quiver and see I can see sort of that this is a bunch of compositions like loops in the quiver, and I'm wondering if there's sort of a, a reason why you chose those for that particular difference. Uh, so, so you mean why I'm taking my uh, symmetric function here? Be oh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the moment map. Yeah. Oh, the moment map. Well, the WV part, you're following a loop between those two things? Yes, in, in some way. Well, yeah, that's what I would say. But really, it's a, you're going from a, because you, you need a loop from a, using an arrow and it's double. So that's why there is that part. And the minus sign, it's because, well, we start with the double arrow. But really, the, the way to uh, look at a quiver in general and get the moment map it will be as follow. So for, let, let me remind you of the very basics. So it's always good at the middle of the uh, week to have something extremely basic. Uh, so let's start with a quiver. We take the double so by just putting arrows in the opposite direction. And as I was saying, we can uh, just look at representations, meaning that we just put a bunch of dimensions at all the vertices. So for example, the, the source and target here, we put some dimension NS and NT, and then we look at the matrix as being uh, NS times NT matrix. Okay, so again, just be careful about my convention on the dimension, but otherwise it's the same as you would usually do. Again, so associating such a matrix that I will call capital A to all little a arrows in the original quiver just gives you a representation space. Okay, so how do you construct your quiver variety then in general? Well, the, the best way to write everything is just to think of these matrices as just being a bigger matrices. Okay, so you just think of them as being endomorphism of the 
uh, vector space that you are fixing by taking the direct sum of all these vector space at all the vertices. Okay, and then the, the moment map is really easy. I, I'm not writing the process structure because, well, it's not an odd one, it's just uh, painful to write. But the moment map is easy because you just take the sum over all the arrows in your original quiver, so before doubling, of what? The matrix representing that original row, commutator with the matrix representing the double. Okay, so, so it's really elementary. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm also not saying that there is an action really the natural one by conjugation because we have a, a big square matrices. But then the point is the following. When you want your reduced variety, your quiver variety, all you do is just fix some parameters again at all the vertices and then you just say that you produce a big matrix which is just a, made of a bunch of identity matrices, multiple of the identities, and you say that your sum of such commutators is equal to it. And then you look at the GIT quotient there. Okay. But again, in all the cases that I will be looking at, we will have just a, a, a smooth uh, manifold in the end, so nothing really fancy will be happening. We will just have a usual uh, orbit space. So that's the general story. So now e examples maybe, uh, because you are already bored, I don't know. Uh, so what is the next thing that you can do to maybe get something uh, more fancy than the case that I was giving uh, before? So remember, what I was doing first was to say that I had just one loop, this x, and I was extending by one arrow v from infinity to zero. So you could just say, well, let, let's put a bunch of arrows instead of just one. That's something very natural to do, okay? Because just think that adding a vertex is more complicated. We don't do that, it's too complicated for us, but adding arrows is fine. Okay, and then when we have this quiver, or rather the, the, the ball of it, we can just apply this machinery. So we fix some dimension vectors, and in our case, we just always do the same thing. We put a n-dimensional space at zero and a one-dimensional space at infinity. And then we produce the corresponding quiver variety, okay, for some parameter e that we take to be non-zero so that we have a, a smooth space, okay, that we are avoiding trouble. And it so happens that when you do that small uh, variation just by adding arrows, you still have a quiver variety which is a phase space for a nice integrable system. Okay, and so it was realized by a bunch of people, so they're right written there. So it was already kind of hidden in that paper of Wilson, but oh, it has been uh, introduced more recently by some other people. But the point is really, if you want to have data interpretation as a, an integrable system, the thing that you need to do is just as in the previous case. One of your two square matrices, you diagonalize it on a dense open subset. And then you look at the other matrix, it will have some free diagonal entries, and then off diagonal, well, th there is something fancy, but not too fancy. So it's basically uh, obtained by just uh, coupling all these uh, vectors and covectors, which are representing these additional arrows that we had. And then th there is a one over the uh, difference of this eigenvalue of the X matrix. And it so happened that, again, if you look at all the traces of Y to an epoch K, such functions are Poisson commuting. Okay, so you can hope to have an integrable system. The, the thing here is that because you're adding arrows, you have a bigger di uh, phase space or of bigger dimension, and basically just looking at this trace of y up to trace of y to the n, it's not enough to have an integrable system. Okay, and here again, maybe I should emphasize that I'm playing with these as being complex manifolds. So for me, an integrable system just means that I have a set of Poisson commuting functions, which uh, is such that uh, we can pick uh, a certain number of them which is equal to half the dimension of the space which are independent. Okay, I, I'm not playing with so algebraically complete integrable system when you have some structure of a, a billion variety here. Let's say that it's just too difficult for me. We are doing simple things for today. Yes? Okay, can you say again why you only have an automorphism, sorry, a gauge group for the zero vertex and that? Oh, yeah, because the thing is that uh, if you take the trace of this relation, you get that the sum of this V alpha W alpha, which is one times one, is equal to uh, lambda zero times N. So it's basically fixed by just taking the trace of that. I'm kind of forgetting this second uh, equality, the, the relation at the infinity vertex, because it's a corollary of that one. Okay, so yeah, that, 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 and really that's why I'm putting always a, a one dimensional space there because then I can just forget about one of these moment map relations. 
Uh, right. So here, I would say that the, the quiver interpretation is nice if you want to just try to think about building uh, a set of Poisson commuting functions. Because as I was saying, the functions which were interesting before were of the form trace of y to some power. And if you think of them on the path algebra of the quiver, what do they represent? They are trace of the matrix representing the loop going k times through your uh, y arrow, okay? And so you could say, well, what's the simplest thing that you can do to get something different than that? And the point is just to say, okay, let's start at the other vertex, the infinity, go up to that zero with one of these added arrow, let's call it v alpha. We go a certain number of times still through that same vertex, uh, sorry, still through the same loop. And then we go down with one of these uh, added double W arrows. Okay, so these are very natural to do. You can compute the Poisson bracket with the original uh, functions you were interested in. These are zero and really the Poisson structure is quite elementary, so that's very easy to get. Uh, and you can also compute the Poisson bracket of these uh, additional functions that you've created. And here's what you can do. Well, basically, I mean, this will be the most complicated equation of the talk, so I hope you see that it's not too hard. You can say, see that if you take alpha is equal to beta and gamma is equal to epsilon, then the right hand side will be vanishing. So at the level of the quiver, what does it mean? It means that you, if you take functions which are of the form, I'm going up with one V alpha, going a few times through that loop y, and then going down with beta is equal alpha, so exactly with the double of that arrow which, wa which I was choosing to go up, then such function, or at least the functions which represent these paths on the quiver variety, these are Poisson commuting. And it so happened that you can build coordinates such that you can show that all these functions give you a Poisson algebra which is commutative. Okay, so in fact you have a, a Poisson algebra of half the dimension of your space, all Poisson commuting, so you have an integrable system. But, uh, and because it, when we go to the multiplicative case, it will be easier not to speak about that. Th there is something else you can do. You can forget about this, uh, this construction that I've set and just focus on all these functions that we had created. And then what you can compute is the following. All these functions that we had and these new uh, ones that we've obtained by these extended uh, paths going through the infinity vertex, they form a very big Poisson algebra of co-dimension n, okay, with a center of dimension n, okay? And that's a slightly more refined, maybe, notion of integrability, which is called degenerate integrability, when you have such a Poisson algebra of co-dimension equal to the dimension of its center, okay? And these are very nice also to play with, okay? And I, I will be working more well with this uh, uh, degenerate integrability setting because uh, they will be easier for me to explain. But so far, is the kind of, of idea more or less clear? Well, you know, infinitely many functions, right? So. Yes, uh, so here I'm saying it's of a functional dimension. Uh, that's what, what I mean by the dimension, so yes. How many do you, take? you can take the first uh, uh, So here basically, in the first case, you, you take all of them and you maybe uh, don't take the case when alpha is equal to d, I think. And here you have to omit some, but really, by, by looking at the local coordinates, you can easily see which one you have to pick or not. So it's not too difficult there to, to see what to do. Uh, what does it work for lambda zero equal to zero? Oh, that's nasty. Uh, so, uh, okay, lambda zero is equal to zero. Uh, Okay, don't take that as a statement. I think you can still have the same uh, Poisson commuting algebra, but maybe just on, on some connected component of the reduced manifold. It may not be a, a, a connected, it, it may have also singularities, uh, and I want to avoid that. So, yeah, see. So, yes, yeah, if, if that parameter is zero, there may be bad things happening, maybe some other components that I can't deal with. Right, um, so this was for a case, uh, well, when we were just extending a one loop quiver. And so you could say, well, what's the next, uh, let's say, uh, natural thing to do? And the natural thing to do is just to say, well, instead of having just a one loop quiver, we can just take a cyclic quiver, okay? So in some way, just think of a, a breaking your loop in terms of a, 
uh, m smaller parts, okay? So these are these uh, x, s variables going through my cyclic quiver. And then what you do, you say, okay, as before, we have to put a new vertex and then add some additional arrows. Okay, so the new vertex, I'm still calling it infinity. Uh, the new arrows, well, it so happens that you can take arbitrarily many of them. Okay, so you take just arrows going from this infinity vertex to anywhere in your cyclic quiver. Uh, and here is my notation if it's not clear. So an arrow going from infinity to s, we call it vs, and then there is an alpha just saying uh, which one of them, because I can have several arrows going from this uh, infinity to the s vertex. Okay, so we have a bigger, bigger quiver, okay? But the point is that uh, there is still a hope to get an integrable system that generalized the previous one, okay? And in some way, uh, this kind of generalization were hinted by Chalik and Selantiev, they, uh, okay, maybe I should explain for a second that in the previous case, in this uh, case, when we had just an extension of a one loop quiver, you can, in fact, uh, map these, uh, the flows of this integrable system to the flows associated to some solution of the KP hierarchy. So this is why there is some interest there uh, to look at these phase spaces, because here the flows on these quiver varieties are very nice and very simple. And what Chalik and Silantiev have done is basically to say, okay, well, what if we consider solution of the KP hierarchy, but with maybe some ZM symmetry? And then the natural thing to do is just to have a cyclic quiver on M vertices in that case. So that's what they, why they were looking at that. But because of this interest, they were just restricting themselves to the case where you had either just extended arrows to one vertices, for example, zero, or when you had the same number of arrows all over the quiver. Okay, but in fact, if you just look at these as quiver varieties and don't really care about this connection, you can work in full generalities like that, having an arbitrary number of arrows a bit everywhere. Okay, and so here is the uh, kind of thing to have in mind is that Instead of this uh, y uh, loop that we had earlier, we will be looking at this uh, y bullet, which I'm calling, which is basically obtained by looking at the double of all these arrows in the original cyclic quiver, but now you should think of them as going one mth through the cyclic quiver counterclockwise. Okay, so intuitively, again, at the level of the quiver, they are really nice to realize. And then you can ask again, okay, can we do something nice? Here, can we seek for integrable system? The thing that you have to be careful about is just to, uh, for the dimension vector to be of the form where you put a one at infinity. So this is the same thing as we did before, but then you put the same dimension at all the other uh, vertices in your cyclic quiver. And then you can just construct a, a very big quiver variety, which I, I will not detail too much, so the thing is that you can have access to the side and look at that if you want. The only point which I want to emphasize is that there exists again some coordinates on that quiver variety such that on some open dense subset, uh, the trace of this y bullet to the km, so what does it mean? Just remember this y bullet mean, meant that you were going counterclockwise through your quiver uh, m's of a time. So y bullet to the m just means that you are going one times counterclockwise through your quiver. So y bullet to the km just means you go k times like that. So it, it's really the, uh, the generalization of this loop that you had earlier going through k times. And then it, it's a really nice function, okay? Because again, uh, the diagonal entries are kind of free and so you, you have a nice expansion and you can show that you have an integrable system. But okay, uh, let me not go into the details here. Maybe let me instead give you just the, the philosophical idea of how to construct things now. Okay, so again, uh, the idea is that the nice functions, as I was saying, re representing going through that cyclic river k times counterclockwise. Okay, and here by nice functions, I really mean that you look at the matrices representing these paths, you take the trace of that, they live on the quiver variety. Okay. But what's the other thing that you can do, really, again, in the, uh, with the idea of what I was go doing earlier, you could start at the infinity vertex, and then go with one of the arrows through the cyclic quiver. You go a bunch of times through that cyclic quiver, and then you come back with the arrow, which is the opposite of the one chosen earlier. And if you take just all such uh, kind of paths of the first two kinds, all the possibilities here, it so happens that you can check that you can form a commutative algebra, again, which is 
a Poisson algebra for the Poisson structure inherited by your quiver variety, which is exactly half the dimension of your space. Okay, I didn't explain the dimension exactly, but it's half the dimension of the space. Yeah, so it's really what you want to have an integrable system. But uh, what you can also do is uh, get a degenerate integrable system. Okay, again, meaning that you may go from infinity to one of these vertices in the cyclic quivers. You go a bunch of time through that loop, and then you say, well, let, let's go back, but maybe from another vertex. Okay, and then if you take all the possible uh, functions that you get from these different kind of paths, you get in fact a Poisson algebra, which has co-dimension n and center of dimension n. So again, it's that notion of degenerate integrability. And here, again, my point is to say that if you just look at them at the level of the quiver, these are the natural things to do. So obviously the, the annoying thing is to count that you have uh, sufficiently many functions, okay? So the, the functional dimension is maybe a bit painful to get, but it's not too hard, okay? Um, so before going to the, let's say, non-commutative rules, are there any questions? How many parameter lambda do you have? Um, so, I, in practice, I just have one for all the vertices in my uh, cyclic quiver because always at infinity, that parameter is determined by the rest by basically taking the, the sum of the trace of uh, such relations. It's completely determining what's happening at infinity. Okay, right, so now for this non-commutative Poisson geometry, let me explain how I'm computing things. Uh, because here you could f have the idea that I'm playing with big matrices with many, var well, okay, not many variables maybe, but really big matrices, so with lots of indices, and obviously you would like to do some computations without indices because that's painful otherwise. So what's the idea? Uh, that I'm using here. I'm, I'm using some formalism that was introduced by uh, Michel Vandenberg about uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and it goes as follows. So if you know this uh, geometric perspective that I was explaining, what we were really doing was to start with uh, some uh, big space. L let's forget about this commutative algebra stuff at the moment. We had some big space, okay, with a Poisson bracket. And then we were saying, okay, in that space, we have a moment map, so we can take a slice, and then some, uh, in nice cases, orbits in that slice. Uh, this is obtained by Hamiltonian reduction, and there is a Poisson structure there. So this is really the, the philosophy of what you have in general. And the point would be to try to mimic that on a non-commutative algebra. So what would be the idea? Well, the idea would be as follows. Let's assume that the big space here on the top right is just uh, the, well, oh, maybe let's look at the, the algebra of functions there. It's just the algebra of function on a representation space. So again, it just means you have a commutative algebra, you just look at the, all the, for example, n-dimensional representations of it. That gives you a space. Okay, and then you could say, okay, can I push all that Hamiltonian reduction structure at the level of the algebra? Okay, so one thing that will be happening, I, I will give a partial definitions later, but one thing that will be happening is that there may be a distinguished element in that algebra, that, let's call it mu, and such that whenever you put this distinguished element to a constant that we call lambda, then when you look at representations of this uh, quotient algebra, they are in fact precisely giving you the slice here that you were considering. Okay, so again, the idea with here would be that the, the matrix, this mu ij, the matrix representing the distinguished element mu, is the moment map for uh, some Poisson structure on the representation space with a, here the action by conjugation of GLN, okay? And you just say, okay, this uh, moment map, we just fix it to a multiple of the identity. And the multiple is the lambda, the lambda that you had uh, fixed the element at the non-commutative level. And then, the last step will be to say, okay, what's the analog then of the, the reduced space when you are looking at this uh, uh, GID quotient here, or the, the re if, again, you think in terms of algebra of functions, just the invariant functions there. Well, the idea is that this will be, you will understand that uh, algebra in terms of a vector space this time, and a vector space obtained by taking this quotient algebra and identifying commutators to zero. 
and it may be the only uh, not clear thing why understand this in terms of vector space. The kind of uh, idea is that in that space, because I'm saying that I have a GLN action on some matrices by conjugation, trace of those matrices will be invariant functions. Okay, and the trace of a commutator is zero. So this is really why you should be playing with that vector space. Okay. But so th this is for the heuristic idea of what should be going on. Okay. And so here is something slightly more precise, uh, so due to Vandenberg. Introduce the following, a notion of a double bracket, okay? So here is the definition if you want to have a look at it. The, let me maybe just emphasize two things. The first thing is that this double bracket, uh, contrary to a Poisson bracket, which would take two functions and give you back a function in an algebra, here it's taking, for example, two elements in that non-commutative algebra and then giving you something in the tensor product of them. So yeah. Intuitively, you think that you may have maybe more information, but it's just something different. But then the fact is that the, the rules are the intuitive ones. You will have some uh, skew symmetry relation. You will have some uh, derivations property, so as you would want for a Poisson bracket. And there is also a notion of a kind of double Jacobi identity that I don't want to write. The upshot is the following. If you are given a double Poisson bracket in, in that very precise sense of Vandenberg, you can induce when you go from the algebra to the commutative algebra of the function on the representation space, you can induce a Poisson bracket there. And in fact, the Poisson bracket is really elementary because, okay, let me maybe write that. That's the only thing I may end up writing. But uh, as I was saying, okay, so the, the algebra function on this representation space it's just generated by entries of matrices representing the element of this algebra, okay? So this is what I'm denoting here. Just the IG entry of the matrix representing the element A in my non-commutative algebra, the KL entry of the matrix representing the element B of my non-commutative algebra. And then the upshot is the following. If I want to compute that Poisson bracket, what do I need to do? Well, what I need to do is first just play at the level of the non-commutative algebra, okay, where I have this double bracket of Vandenberg. So I can construct this double bracket of A and B, which is an element of the non-commutative algebra tensor itself. So let me use a strong form of pseudo notation and write this double bracket as follow. So as being double bracket of A, B prime and so second. Okay. And then the, the only formula that you need to know this Poisson bracket is to say, you compute this double bracket then you look at the first element, this is an element of your non-commutative algebra, and you say, okay, let's take the KG entry of the matrix representing this element of the non-commutative algebra. And then the second tensor product gave you also an element in this uh, non-commutative algebra. And here you take the IL entry of the matrix representing this second element. And that's it. You have computed this Poisson bracket using something which has completely determined at the level of the non-commutative algebra. So maybe, I don't know, the first time you see it is or it's easy or complicated, but at least from my point of view, it's very easy for computations, that's the point. Okay, so now back to our setting. Uh, we have here some uh, way to go from some new, this double Poisson bracket, uh, a new non-commutative version of a Poisson bracket on the non-commutative algebra which induces a Poisson bracket on the representation space. But what's in fact <laughs> even better is that Vandenberg knew how to define a non-commutative notion of a moment map at the level of the algebra as being some element of it having some particular relation with the double bracket, okay, that I will not write on, but it's not too hard. And then here's the upshot. If you have such a distinguished element, when you go to representation spaces, the moment map is now given by the matrix representing this element. Okay, because a matrix is just an element of GLN, which you identify with GLN star, so it's really a, a moment map in the usual sense. Okay, and here for an action again by conjugation on this representation space. Okay, so this is the correspondence before reduction. And then what you can in fact get is that when you want to understand this uh, reduced Poisson algebra of some invariant function which inherit a Poisson bracket by Hamiltonian reduction, then the point is that it's completely determined, here the Poisson bracket there, by some uh, 
Li bracket on that vector space that I was giving you earlier. So again, what is this A lambda? This is just the algebra A, where you quotient by putting this moment map equal to just a multiple, uh, sorry, just a, a constant lambda. And then you identify commutators to zero. So that's what you form, okay? And then you have a Li bracket here, which descends from the Poisson, the, sorry, from the double Poisson bracket of the non-commutative algebra. Okay. And the way to get this uh, Li bracket, it, it's very easy because you just compute your double bracket, you take the product of the two uh, factors in this tensor product, okay? And you look at that element modulo commutator. So again, computationally, it's very easy. And the point is now that if you want to understand what is the tray, sorry, what is the Poisson bracket of two traces of some elements representing an element of your algebra? So if you want the Poisson bracket of two elements here on the bottom right, then all you need to do is just look at this formula here, which tells you that you just compute the Poisson bracket of, uh, sorry, the double Poisson bracket of these two elements on the non-commutative algebra. You take the product of the two tensor factor, and then you look at the trace of the matrix representing that. So again, here, I just want to advertise that these are explicit formulas which are easy to play with. Otherwise, things are a bit complicated. But so, is there any question about this general formalism? No? Okay. Uh, maybe yeah. I have a question, which is, uh, what type of thing is a non-commutative moment map? Is it an element in like a center of the algebra? Or is it uh, no, it, it's just an element of, of the uh, algebra having some particular uh, double Poisson bracket with the other elements. So it, it's not necessarily in the center or anything like that. So for example, if you look at the algebra as being the pass algebra of a quiver, oh. of a double quiver, this yeah. non-commutative moment map is just the sum of the commutators of the element in the original quiver with that double. Okay. So, so it's really the analog of what you had for quiver varieties okay. in the construction. I see, but it can't be any element of the algebra. Well, no, well, it's, well, okay, maybe I should say, it's not necessarily in the center or anything like that. You don't have a, a big characterization of it. But basically, when there is one, uh, the only way to have another one is by shifting it by a constant, nothing else. Okay, so in some way, it's rigid in that sense, uh, the existence. Yeah. Right, uh, so this was for kind of the formalism which was used earlier because let me just give you this example so that you, you make the link with uh, the first part of the talk. And so if I give you this uh, one loop quiver that I was starting with, okay, so here I'm not even extending it by another arrow, I'm just doing things that are quite elementary. And if I'm now taking the double of that quiver, then I can look at the pass algebra of this double quiver, which is just a free algebra on two generators. Okay, so, so far it's quite easy. And now if you want to write on what is this double Poisson bracket, just to give you an example, well, it's again something very easy. So the double bracket of these elements in the, uh, the original loops are just zero, okay? And then the, this uh, double bracket of the two of them is just one tensor one. So it's like what you would expect for something to be maybe a, a, a symplectic pairing just to have a, something of like equal to one. So that's really what's happening here. And if, well, if you want an example here, the, the, this moment map is just this commutator of the x and y. Okay. So, yeah, th this is just a, an example, uh, but really you can have that for any quiver by just a, a quick generalization of that. It's not too complicated. Uh, the point is the following. So when you go to this extended quiver, basically the, this Poisson bracket stayed the same, okay? And in particular, the double bracket of an element y with itself is still equal to zero, okay? And basically, if you, okay, I will not do it, but if you play with that formula, you can really easily get that because the element y of the double bracket with themselves, which are zero, these traces are all equal to zero, okay? So this is really uh, trivial from that point of view. But that's what we were using to form an integrable system, okay? So this is just to give you a feel of what was going on. Uh, but now for the second part of my talk, well, okay, maybe in fact the third part, sorry, uh, I, I want to go to the quasi version of that and play with multiplicative quiver varieties. Okay, so I will define those in a minute, but let me just uh, state what is the general formalism here. So the idea is that we will be playing with a quasi version of Hamiltonian reduction. So what does it mean? 
we will again start with some big space. Let's forget about the other thing that I've written at the moment. So we have a big space which has a quasi-Poisson bracket, meaning that it's really like a Poisson bracket, but it has some failure to satisfy Jacobi identity. But that failure is not too bad because it's completely governed by some action of a Lie group acting there. So here, you know this example, for example, you, you can consider that you have an action by GLN uh, through conjugation of some square matrices. Okay, and so here, that action would determine what is that failure of your Poisson bracket, to, well, of this bracket to be Poisson, in fact, to be quasi-Poisson. Okay. But the upshot is the following. If you have such a quasi-Poisson bracket, there may be a corresponding moment map, okay, which is a quasi-version of what we had earlier. I will not write a, a definition, but the point is still the same, that there is a way to do a reduction, meaning that you can uh, construct a slice here and then look at the orbit space, well, in nice situation, or just a GIT quotient, and this, a smaller space, will inherit a Poisson bracket. So it, it, it's really the same idea. And then the point of Vandenberg was to say, well, this similar construction also admits a non-commutative analog, meaning that if your big space you are starting with is in fact a representation space of some non-commutative algebra, then you can in some way translate all the definition of a well, not all the time, but you, in some nice cases, you can translate the definition of being a quasi Poisson bracket using a double version of that on the non commutative algebra. And you have also this notion of a non commutative moment map in this quasi setting. And the thing is that you can still use the exact same formula, which is very nice. So the defining uh, properties of this qu double quasi Poisson bracket are slightly different. Okay, but the formula when you induce on representation spaces are still the same. Okay, and the final upshot before going to these multiplicative quiver varieties is the following. So what Vandenberg realized is that there is such a double quasi Poisson bracket on some localization of pass algebra of double quivers. Okay, and so because in the first part of the talk, what was governing everything on quiver varieties was a double Poisson bracket on the pass algebra of a double quiver. Here, what will be happening in this last part of the talk is that there will be a double quasi Poisson bracket governing the structure of multiplicative quiver varieties associated with that algebra. Okay. So it's a bit technical, but now I will move on to define these multiplicative quiver varieties. But for, is there any question about this general formalism? Okay, if not... So, so you, you know it's some example in which it is actually... Uh, so it's always a wild character variety, you, you know this stuff, or...? Uh, well, in fact, it's a, you, you will see uh, an example uh, later on, but... Okay, there are some cases where it's obvious. Maybe I, I will show the first one and then you, you will think, oh, well, that's obvious that this one is a, is a character variety, but in general, you may need some things some uh, tweaking to do. Okay. Okay. Uh, right, so let's go to this multiplicative setting and first, well, okay, sorry for another long slide, but then we will just again see quivers and it will be all easy. Um, so let me just emphasize what's the difference when you go to additive quiver varieties, like I'm sure many of you know and were used to, to the multiplicative case. Well, the idea is that you again look at the representation space of the a pass algebra of the quiver, so so far nothing is changing, but the moment map, okay, will be changing, okay. So here, what we will be using is this multiplicative moment map, which instead of being a commutator of the matrices representing the arrows with the double in the quiver, what we will look at of is some function which is made by looking at element of the form identity plus a narrow, well, the matrix representing an arrow in the original quiver times the matrix representing the double, or here, if you swap the two elements, you will take the same element, the identity plus this a star a, but with a minus sign. Okay, so to the minus one. In particular, because there are in some invertibility conditions, you work on some uh, invertible set of representations there. That's a, a small thing, but apart from that, the, the only difference when you go to this multiplicative case is that uh, these are the kind of moment map that you are looking at. Okay. And obviously, they're, they're, here because you, you are taking products, you have an ordering to take, okay, but up to isomorphism, it's not really necessary to specify it. Okay. The point is, when you have this multiplicative notion of a moment map, 
then the story is the same. What you can just say is that you put this as being just a, like an, an identity matrix or multiple of the identity, but again, it's decomposed in terms of the vertex set. And then you look at the GIT quotient by the action by conjugation of GLN on this big space of representations. So really, in, in terms of writing it, it, it's almost the same story. It's just that here there is a perspective of quasi Hamiltonian reduction, meaning that you have a, a quasi Poisson structure to start with. It's not the usual Poisson structure of quiver varieties. So things are different, but morally, it's kind of the same thing that is happening. So just let me give me, uh, sorry, let me give you a, an example here so that you see a bit what's going on with that simple quiver that we had earlier. Okay, so that one. So as we saw, the representation space, okay, was just given by two square matrices and then some covector and a vector. And here the only difference, as I was saying, is that there are some invertibility conditions. So the invertibility conditions are just obtained by asking that some determinants are non-zero. So it's still, uh, uh, you, you are still uh, on a generic subspace there. But the point is that from that uh, space of invertible representation, you can now produce the multiplicative quiver variety. Okay, so this is the one which is written here. And it looks really similar to what you had earlier, because remember, what we had in the additive case was commutator of XNY minus WV is a multiple of the identity. It's really looking similar, okay? It's just that instead of the commutator, we have such product of the form identity plus an arrow times the double arrow. But otherwise, it looks pretty much the same. And here is the point which is interesting from the point of view of the integrable system story. As we had for the uh, earlier the cow germ as a system, when you had a quiver variety and you could diagonalize one square matrix and just understand these eigenvalues as being position of some uh, particle to have a physical interpretation, let's say. Here what you can do is, again, uh, diagonalize one of the matrices, let's call it X, uh, then you uh, put the covector just to be made of ones. You can do that on a dense subset. And then what's happening is, well, for some reason you don't play with the other Y matrix, but you have to shift it uh, by the inverse of that X matrix. But this matrix, there exists some nice coordinates such that these, with this sigma J, your matrix looks like that, which for many people doesn't make sense, but for people in the integrable system community is really nice. Because the Poisson structure that you obtain by reduction, in terms of these local coordinates, uh, it is log canonical, okay? Meaning that if really locally you, you can just express these x and these sigma function as being uh, some exponentials, okay? Then you have two kind of, um, two kind of coordinates which are uh, canonically conjugate, okay? And moreover, you have uh, this very nice Hamiltonian which is really relevant in that integrable system community because it, it's the McDonald form of the Royson or Schneider system. Okay, so from that point of view, it's really nice. And what is also very nice is that once you know that there is a Poisson structure that induced by a quasi Poisson bracket, which was induced by a double quasi Poisson bracket defined at the level of the non commutative algebra, you can compute there that the trace of any power of this y plus x inverse matrix, these things are Poisson commuting. So in fact, you can create an integ yes, you can create an integrable system there. So this is why this space is, uh, is interesting. But in, in some way, this was kind of known, okay? And maybe for the question from earlier, you, you, you may see that uh, when I'm doing this, uh, when I'm using this y plus x inverse instead, you can write this thing as being x, this y plus x inverse times x inverse, y plus x inverse. Okay, so you have this uh, multiplicative commutator which you have for, uh, for character variety. So it, it would be a torus uh, with one uh, punctures and this is, the, uh, this is the data that you put there. Oh, okay. the genus one stuff. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, and, and in some way it's all genus one, uh, the things that will appear. Yeah. Uh, okay, right, so this was for this example, but now, uh, because I gave quiver earlier that were interesting in the additive story, let's look at the multiplicative story. And then, well, this is getting a bit technical, but the point is that when you do the same construction with that quiver, you get, again, a space, okay, which you can interpret as being a space of some integrable system, being the, the 
thin virtual national idol systems or a version of this virtual national idol system with, with more uh, what, what, you know, higher dimensional space with more degrees of freedoms. And, and here is the fun fact because uh, that space is very natural from this uh, point of view to construct, okay? You have a Poisson bracket there from this uh, big construction of Vandenberg, okay? So it's something in some way uh, uh, quite easy to construct. But the point is that uh, this point of view was really nice because uh, this uh, space of the Russian national system with spin degrees of freedoms uh, was in the integrable system literature, uh, not known, okay? So some people were able to write on what was the integrable system uh, and to write on some equations of motion, there, but they were asking, okay, what is the underlying Hamiltonian formulation? What is the, the Poisson bracket governing these equations that we can write on? And the point is that uh, from here, the point of view of multiplicative quiver variety, we, we get that for free. Okay, and so that's something that I, I proved with uh, Oleg Chalik. Uh, and which was published uh, almost two years ago, is that, again, on some subspace of uh, this uh, big space that you can construct associated with that uh, extended quiver, you have, let, let's just look at the last part, you can explicitly write on the Poisson bracket in terms of uh, local coordinates, and it proves some conjectures about the Hamiltonian formulation of this uh, spin Royston national system. So it's very nice in the end that we were able to get that without too much work once you know this formalism, okay? So it's really good. So uh, this was for the case of this quiver. And again, in the first part of the talk, I was telling you that uh, there are cyclic quivers. So you could say, well, what's happening? Okay, yeah, maybe before moving to the cyclic quivers. Again, I, I will not emphasize that, but you can uh, construct some degenerate integrable system by looking at the exact same kind of path at the level of the quiver. So the understanding at that level is still very clear. And then you can move on to cyclic quivers. And well, here, these are more recent things because uh, even in the additive case, uh, we, we could unearth some uh, integrable system that were not written down uh, until a, a few years ago. So here, it, it's kind of new, it has really a, a few years. And this is some stuff that I did either with a Oleg Chalik, so again, uh, that's, that would be the case where you take this cyclic quiver, just at the, extend it by exactly one arrow to one of the vertices of that cyclic quiver, or the general extension is something that I, I uh, ended up finishing to write on the uh, past summer. Uh, and so again, the general idea would be to say that when you think at the level of the quiver, you will want to go counterclockwise by one m of a turn, okay? This would be a, a, a nice thing to look at, and then you would like to build an integrable system from there, from that. Okay, again, meaning that when you go to matrices representing that path, you want to build an integrable system from that. And without going into the details, the point is that uh, you can take kind of the, the same uh, path as you were writing in the additive case. You can compute what is the dimension of all the sorry, the functional dimension of all the functions that represent such paths. And you can get that it's giving you a Poisson algebra of co-dimension n with a center of dimension n, so a degenerate integrable system, which is quite nice. Uh, you can also get a, a Liouville integrability, meaning that you have a really a Poisson, com sorry, an abelian Poisson algebra of half the dimension of the space, but it's very, very technical. So. Uh, I will uh, avoid that and maybe instead uh, go to the, the few things that could be done from there on because that was really easy on integrable system in the end. So maybe let, let's uh, just guess what can be done next. It would be more interesting for many of you. Uh, so several people here are, are looking at enumerative geometry to uh, get some solution to integrable hierarchies. And as I was saying, uh, there is a nice correspondence which exists, for example, between this chaos Jamozo system from the first part of the talk with solution of the KP hierarchy, okay? And what's happening when you go from this additive setting to the multiplicative setting is that you expect, uh, well, and you don't just expect, you can prove in some in the easy cases, uh, that the solu well, that the flows of this Royston-Arschneider system 
okay, will parameterize some solution this time of either the QKP or the 2D total that is here, okay. Okay, so it's the natural thing to expect when you go to that next level of uh, difficulty, I should say. But again, you could hope to have more, really. It means that you could hope to have uh, some uh, extend some more general solution of these hierarchies, for example, with the ZM symmetry, in which you would have a relation with the cyclic quivers. And we have some results in that direction with like Chalik, but again, uh, there is still a lot of things to do. Okay, there are also challenges which are really nice. So for example, I'm telling you that uh, I'm taking some parameters which are generic because I just want some structure of complex manifolds, but I had the question at the very beginning, what's happening for the other parameters? And that's a good question, I don't know in general. Uh, well, I, I really don't know, in fact. Uh, and then, to go back to that subject of the quantum conference that we are having, what is the quantization of all these uh, uh, integrable systems? Okay, so there are some construction of, uh, for example, quantization of multiplicative curve varieties, but to get the corresponding integrable system, it doesn't feel really natural, so it would be nice to maybe have something uh, better than that. And there has been some progress in that direction in some uh, uh, papers. So when we were writing uh, uh, in 2017 the case of uh, just a cyclic river extended by just one arrow, there was some work of Braverman and Ting of Fingelberg uh, doing the quantization of these integrable system at the exact same time. But the case with more arrows, okay, so with spin degrees of freedom, it's not known. And uh, as I was saying about that, uh, they were also uh, looking at a uh, cyclotomic data in that work. So there may be a connection there that I have no idea about. Okay. And so now from the more, uh, more from the perspective of these uh, double brackets, which are a tool that I really like because it's easy to compute things with them, I would like to get other integrable system from that. So first thing that we are finishing to do with like Chaik is to get the face space of this elliptic Kerr-Germoso system, which is just a, a generalization of this Kerr-Germoso system from the first part using a double bracket, okay, and so let's say that it's almost done. But then there are more changes. So for example, uh, there, there is also an elliptic version of this first Schneider system, and you could say, okay, what would be a non-commutative algebra with a double quasi-Poisson bracket from which you can deduce all the Poisson geometry of such a phase space? And I mean, I have really no idea what to do. So uh, this is something uh, really difficult. And maybe for, for experts, something that you could solve that question, and which is a bit tangential, would be that uh, all these uh, double Poisson algebra from the first part of the talk, they are in fact uh, some non-commutative cotangent space associated with uh, the quivers without doubling them. And so th this is a very nice way to do things. And in some sense, when you want to go to uh, from the normal double Poisson bracket to the double quasi Poisson bracket, you would maybe expect to have a quasi version of these non-commutative cotangent spaces. And I, I don't really know if it exists, but at least with we, Volek, we believe that if they exist, then uh, we should know to get an answer for this phase space of the elliptic version of the system. But I mean, there are lots of things to do. Uh, and still, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to do them, which is good because I have work to do then. Uh, right, so on that, I will finish. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Nassim, for this talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Oh, you have plenty of questions. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, first of all, I think it's um, uh, for this non commutative quasi Poisson, uh, we have a paper with uh, Alex Takeda and mm -hmm. Yes, I suppose about it's some very general story about pre Calabio algebras and so on. And with Natalia Yudel, we try to figure out a, a, a concrete examples. It seems to be exactly gives some correction to Poisson, set it on space of representations before uh, uh, quotient by jail. You don't have Poisson structure, but on the portion to get Poisson structure. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so this formalism and it works very well. And there's also a paper by Adesky and um, Sokolov. Yeah, for mm -hmm. example, elliptic algebras, mm -hmm. uh, yes. uh, uh, they made it like non-commuted projective space with Poisson structure from this. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's all, all the option. This is this is quotient and, uh, yeah, and the question is, uh, the mm -hmm. following, this, you have this, this plane of integral system, but there was some kind of geometric source of integral system, I think, coming from Baville, maybe. Uh, you consider Poisson surface, 
Mm -hmm. And consider more the space of coherent shifts, like like spectral curves and line bundles. It's a little bit also Poisson variety. But now if your Poisson surface Poisson surface is fibered by uh, let's say elliptic curves or some uh, degenerate elliptic curves, then we get automatically the structure of integral system of it. And my guess it's all this your examples, it's kind of complicated blow ups of maybe C star squared infinity and you'd consider this uh, like irregular in multiplicative uh, 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 so, so uh, yeah. so, then my guess it's in this case because one can uh, like for Hitchin system one can construct geometrically uh, a lot of them and it is all classical and uh, my guess it's also one can consider mm -hmm. like like curves and C star square with some conditioned in infinite in line bundles that will be uh, mm -hmm. So, so I think it's classically known that this elliptic algebra system can be obtained as an Hitchin system. Yeah. Uh, but in some way, what we want to do from this perspective is have a finite dimensional reduction picture of that. Yes, but, yeah. it, but also, but then if you think on the surfaces, uh, one can immediately can do it kind of non commutative yes, mm. yeah. yeah, I know that uh, Volodya Rupsov <laughs> hinted that same thing. And uh, yeah, I, I have to think in that direction, okay. yes. yes. So, so, so there are uh, Kalajan model system for any Li algebra uh, without Li algebra. So, can you do that also in that case? It's not commutative approach. Uh, so the I'm working on that. Uh, okay, m maybe not uh, the exceptional cases. I don't know yet. Uh, but that is. So what we are having with Oleg in that, when I'm saying elliptic algebra model system, is obviously the A N case. And to go from the A N to the B N case, the idea is that. Uh, we have to take the non-commutative cotangent space of an elliptic curve and take the skew group algebra with Z2. Okay, so, so to understand the automorphism of your elliptic curve when you 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 mark you, you send a point to its negative, uh, and uh, well, we've not written that, but it's it's at least morally it should work. Uh, but yeah, we are working on that at the moment. But yeah, other cases with uh, with other symmetric groups, it's more complicated. I don't know yet how to do that. Yes. But yeah, in theory, we would really like to obtain uh, all that formalism in terms of a non-commutative algebra. But yeah, I think that maybe outside the A and another uh, B, C, and case, it's it will well, and obviously the end. And by this generation, it will not be working. Yeah. Okay, maybe I have a kind of a vague question too. So I'm uh, pretty ignorant about this whole uh, integrable system classification, but I know there's some sort of trichotomy, like additive, multiplicative, mm -hmm. elliptic. And uh, you said you get some, some systems from uh, like a kind of ordinary Hamiltonian quotient, another one from multiplicative Hamiltonian quotient. Do they sort of map? So, so in a similar trichotomy? Or? <laughs> Let's say that geometrically I would. I don't understand that very well, but the, the point is that, uh, okay, maybe I have to go back a few slides, but, uh, okay, maybe it was, uh, right, so uh, this, when I'm saying Rosener Schneider system, it's the trigonometric Rosener Schneider system, so, it, well, in some way you can see that by saying that sigma is an exponential of the pi and you have some exponential of the qi, so in some way it's tr trigonometric or hyperbolic in both the position and the momenta, while the curve of the system more, the rational form that I gave was both rational in the position and momenta. And so, yeah, at the moment, let's say that we can do the square of having anything which is either rational or trigonometric in momenta and positions. Mm -hmm. But going to the elliptic case is more cumbersome. I yeah. see. There's no sort of elliptic Hamiltonian quotient. So, uh, well, for this elliptic algebra of system, meaning that you are a rational in the position, el uh, sorry, elliptic in the position, rational in the momenta, that would be a, a usual Hamiltonian reduction. But outside that case, no idea, really. Can I ask, or is it taking too long? Uh, uh, go for it. Yeah. So, do you have some uh, mm, not really ad hoc construction for the quantum quasi Hamiltonian reduction? So, there is this formalism like you have the moment mapping. I did the Hamiltonian reduction. You can dualize and then you can quantize algebras there mm -hmm. and you're good to go. So it's just some statement like now I take a quasi moment map 
And so like dualizing, you get functions on the group uh, or maybe the dual Poissonic group, I don't know. And then you take the quantum group instead of like the universal enveloping algebra as in the additive case. Uh, is there some machinery to do quantum quasi, I don't know, yeah. Uh, so at least for these multiplicative curve varieties, there is a paper by David Jordan who is doing really quantized multiplicative curve varieties. So I think it's really the title of the, the paper. And they uh, also have a notion of quantum moment or quasi-moment stuff. Y yes, yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this appears in your story as well. <laughs> it may conjecturally appear to tackle the, the quantization issue in the end, but yeah, I'm not doing anything quantum at the moment, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, if there's no more questions, let's thank Maxime again. Thank you.